Good evening, brethren. We're glad to see everyone here. Uh, we do have quite a few announcements, just a kind of a rehearsal of what Brother Stewart went through this morning, but we'll get to those later. Our dear brother Roberts has our uh, song selections for tonight. He'll be leading us in singing to the Lord. Those songs have been posted. And since we're back to the regular Sunday evening routine, it will be the second sermon from Brother Crowley. So that will be wonderful, too. Let's begin this evening's service with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time that we can set aside from what we consider busy days. And they are in so many ways. Many of them are worldly cares, Lord, and we don't ever want those to get in the way of what's truly important, which is our service to you and our chances to be with the brethren and to collectively lift our voices in song, pray to you, read from your holy word, and study more deeply into the truths found in the Bible. We hope, Father, that we will empty ourselves of worldly cares at this time and concentrate on what brought us together at the building this evening. Father, please help us to look around and notice those who might not be here. Reach out to them if, if we can, do for them if we're able. Help those that suffer at this time of year, which brings so much joy to so many people, but almost unbearable sorrow to others for various reasons. For those that are part of the household of faith, help us to see what we can do with your guidance and assistance. And for those who have never obeyed the gospel, maybe there's something at this time of year that we can do to reach them. Perhaps they're thinking about things they've never thought about before. Whatever might be the case, Lord, help us to remember that we are Christians and that that's the most important thing we could ever do in this life is to live faithfully as you would have us to do. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Get all my accoutrements out here. Uh, before we have our first song, would you please turn to number 714 and mark that as the song of invitation. 714. And what we're going to do uh, with the invitation song is we will uh, sing all three verses and then the chorus of that song. At that at the appropriate time. For those that are on the internet that are new, uh, we're using the songs of the church, the songbook, and uh, we're going to be 714, if you have that, if you do not and you're using another one, uh, the title of the song is What Will Your Answer Be? And that's going to be our invitation song. And after you've uh, marked that, if you'll turn it over to number 475, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We're going to sing three verses of this song, one, two, and four, and then we're going to sing the chorus. One, two, and four of this song. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When he shall 
come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found. His righteousness alone, all blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking fast. All other ground is sinking fast. At this time, we'll have our scripture reading. If you'd like to follow along with me, the scripture reading for tonight will be from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. That is Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. And I will be reading in the New, the New King James Version. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Good to see you all. I think it may be, as I said this morning, it seems like we're gradually having more and more and come and assemble with us, and that's encouraging. Tonight, the lesson is about Satan. And if you saw the way I listed the title in the bulletin, it's Satan dot, 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 really, and two question marks. And the two questions marks is to represent the idea that I think there are fewer and fewer people who believe about Satan. If we said, yes, I believe in Satan, people might say, really? <laughs> really, you believe in Satan? It seems like in the past few years, the idea of Satan has disappeared from a lot of people's beliefs. And I don't guess I really know why, but I'm thinking part of it is that people increasingly have a kind of rationalism as their guiding principle. And by that, I mean they trust their own reasoning and their own thinking more than they trust anything else. If something doesn't seem right or doesn't seem reasonable to them, they just disregard it. Uh, they choose not to believe that. And maybe that's especially true if it's something that they don't like. And I don't think a lot of people like to believe in Satan. And I'm thinking maybe one of the reasons that Satan has fallen from credibility, maybe it's partly the way he's been portrayed over the years, over the centuries, wearing the red suit, carrying the pitchfork, <laughs> having horns and a forked tail. <laughs> Where do those ideas come from? I don't know. One person suggested maybe they came out of the Middle Ages. I don't know. But maybe it's those strange depictions of the devil that have caused him to have not a lot of credibility anymore. One thing I do know, there's a lot of things I don't know <laughs> about Satan, but one thing I do know is you're never going to find him depicted that way in the Scriptures. You're never going to find him depicted in any kind of comical way. And you're never going to find him depicted in any kind of fictional way. The Bible depicts Satan as some a real thinking, reasoning entity that's very smart, that's very cunning. Paul in Ephesians 6 writes about the wiles of the devil. A very well-known preacher many years ago used to say, he was known for turning a phrase, he would say one of the devil's greatest wiles is wait a while. And that is certainly true. But wiles, if you look at the footnote, says scheming, 
In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes of Satan's craftiness. If you're looking in these days for straightforward clarity and communications, don't be looking at the things that Satan has said. You look someplace else, you're not going to find it from him. In fact, his purpose is to be deceiving. His purpose is to be deceitful. John 8, 44, to some of his opposition, <laughs> Jesus made the very unflattering comparison. He says, you are of your father, the devil. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. For he is a liar and the father of it. And in another lesson when we talked about Satan lying, <laughs> lying's all he's got. He's got nothing good to offer. So if you've got nothing good to offer, what do you do? You lie and try to deceive people. So I just want to emphasize here that Jesus does not speak of Satan as some unreal, some fictional character. He speaks of him as being real, having a real identity, having a real um, personality. And if we look in the scriptures, there are conversations that are recorded with Satan. When Satan approached Eve, he spoke with her. He reasoned with her. This depicts Satan as a real entity. Same is true when Satan approached Jesus in the wilderness. He spoke with Jesus. Jesus engaged him in a dialogue. Satan quoted scripture. From the context in Luke chapter 4, Satan even seemed to know when it was time to get out of that conversation with Jesus. He realized he'd lost. He went away, the scripture says, until a more opportune time. So to me, anybody who reads any of this, maybe especially that conversation with Jesus, you come away with this idea that Satan is a real reasoning consciousness. And who would believe that the scriptures would record a, a, a made-up scene with Jesus? Who, who can believe that the scriptures would say, oh, here's a conversation that Jesus had with Satan, when in fact Satan is not real? Satan does not exist. I just can't imagine the scriptures doing that. Satan is real. Jesus spoke to something real. Now, does that mean that Satan walks the earth today in some physical form? No, it does not. Satan and other demonic spirits were allowed to be on this earth, walk the earth, interact with people only when there were those around like the apostles or prophets or other people who had the ability to work miracles to control them. You're not going to find an instance where they were there where there wasn't something there that had greater power than they did. So you're not going to bump into Satan down at the Walmart. Does that mean Satan's not dangerous? No, it doesn't. The Bible describes to us Satan as a dangerous entity. How can that be? I think it's just as simple. Just like God and Christ have those who have accepted their doctrine and spread their godly principles, on the earth today there are those who have accepted Satan's doctrine. They have adopted or adopted his principles, and they're spreading those principles. The Apostle John explains, 1 John 3.10, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The Bible describes the children of both. Just as we are the children of God, if we accept his principles and live his principles and spread his principles, Satan has his children too. There are those among us who have accepted and are living out and spreading those principles. So, uh, in, G in the times of the New Testament, in Acts 8, there were those who were representatives of Jesus' doctrine. Acts 8, 4 says they went everywhere preaching the word. But in 1 Thessalonians 2, a very interesting passage says that there were also the representatives of Satan's there. They were trying to forbid that doctrine to be spread. That's what Satan does. He doesn't like the truth getting out because that kind of counter, that undermines his lies. So I believe we need to know about Satan and his principles. We need to realize there are those representatives among us. They're not wearing red costumes. They're dangerous. Just like Satan is their cunning. Again, if you've got nothing good to sell, you've got to be deceptive about your product. So there are many different ways we can learn about Satan. One way is just to look at things Satan has said about himself. That's what I want us to do this evening. Just take a couple of things that Satan has said and see what we can deduce about him from them. 
And the passage I want us to look at, you might have guessed by the scripture reading, is the one in Genesis chapter 3. Seems to me that some of the most telling incidents about Satan are some of the earliest ones that are recorded. And the dialogue recorded at the, at the read at the beginning of the lesson from Genesis 3, I suggest to you we learn volumes about Satan. The key lines, I would say, are in verse 1 and verse 4 and 5. But let me just read the whole connective passage there. And now that you know the topic, what are we learning about Satan? Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the tree, uh, trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, for you shall not touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in verse 1, Satan says, did God, did, did he say that you can't eat of all the different kinds of fruit? Verse 4, he says, you shall not surely die. Verse 5 is Satan recounting some of the good or at least good sounding things that he implies would be ease if she ate of that fruit. See what we can learn. And I don't want to sound too colloquial, but as I read these verses, as I read the things that Satan has said, I think I hear kind of a little deceitfulness in his voice. I can hear a little bit of pretended surprise. Did God really tell you that? In the first verse of chapter 3, it says he's cunning. I think we hear that. At least I can hear it in his tone. Can't you hear the pretended surprise? Maybe Satan appears to be a little stunned that God should have said such a thing. Did he, re did he really tell you that? And then comes the flat denial. You will not surely die. God said you would. The fact is, Satan alleges, you will not fully, you will not die. So, an interesting set of statements. God has just spoken an important truth to Eve. But God, but Satan is right there to say, what? God told you that? Oh, that's not true. Satan knows that what God said is true. But his objective is that he does not want that truth to sink into Eve's heart and have its desired effect on Eve. So he tries to quickly nullify that truth. And we might remember that Jesus himself told us that's exactly the way Satan works. In the, in the parable of the sower, he spoke. Jesus spoke explicitly about the word of God being planted in the hearts of people. For example, in Mark 4.15, he says that when the word of God is sown in the heart, when the people hear the word of God then, this is Mark 4.15, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. If you want an example, a practical example of how that works, just look in Genesis chapter 3. That's exactly what Satan is trying to do to Eve. He is trying to get the word of God out of Eve's heart before it begins to grow there and produce the desired effect of obedience. So, from this one instance, I would like to us to notice three things, three ways that Satan tries to undermine the effectiveness of God and tries to undermine the effectiveness of God's word. First, Satan is trying to get Eve to think negatively about God. His very first words were designed to, to introduce into her mind a negative impression of God. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree? Here is the suggestion that God is trying to deprive Eve of something. And notice the cleverness here. <laughs> In one strategic blow, Satan takes Eve's attention off of all the good things that God has given her and focuses the whole attention on the one thing that God has said she cannot have. The suggestion is that God, God is the one that's keeping you from having some good things that could be yours, from having some good things that should be yours, the fruit of that tree. And later Satan begins to talk about some of the benefits he would allege would come to her if she ate it. The implication is that she would be much happier if she could have the fruit of that one particular tree, but God, God is the one that is keeping her from having it. God is the one that is depriving her of it. What a clever way to get someone to think negatively about God. 
But let me ask you, <laughs> isn't that the same thing that people do today? Isn't that the way many people portray God as the one who deprives us of things? The world tells us there's so many fun things out there, but God is trying to keep us from enjoying them. And in a lot of cases, not only do they make fun of our narrow-minded God, but, but as I've said before, they make up their own God. They say, oh, my God, my God doesn't care if I do this. It's fine with my God if I participate in these activities. They ridicule us for believing in a God who is so narrow-minded that our God won't let us participate in the things that their God will let them participate in. I think the bottom line is how little, how very little these people understand about the one true God of heaven. How much they do not understand about the God of the Bible. We understand those who have studied... Have you ever noticed that those who are the most critical of the Bible are the ones who know the least about it? Have you ever seen a person who's really studied God's word that was so negative about it? But these people, they know very little about the concept of the true God that's in the Bible. They imagine the way that he is, and of course they imagine their own God that's much more tolerant. The God of the Bible is the one who created us. He is the one who knows the most about us. He knows the way that we can have the happiest life here. He knows the way we can have the most fulfilled life, the most satisfying life. Those statements in the Bible, as I've said before, they're guardrails. They are guardrails to keep us out of that territory that is not going to be good for us. God knows what's good for us, and he's graciously shared that with us in the words that he has given to us. And in the end, in a way, it's sad. How much happiness and contentment are those people going to miss the ones who allow God's words to be discredited and removed from their heart? Beware of those today who use the technique of Satan, the one he used on Eve, of trying to get us to think negatively about God. Second, in his discussion with Eve, Satan is trying to get Eve to think skeptically about God. He's trying to get Eve to doubt God. Isn't that the next thing that Satan says? He says God has, that God has not told her the truth. He is saying God has lied to her. Eve had told him, God has said, you shall not eat nor touch it lest you die. Satan says, that's just not true. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What better way to try to get a person to be skeptical, to have doubts about someone, than to say, what they told you is not true. That person is just lying to you. But again, how often do we hear that today? Isn't that some of the tactics that people use today? Telling us that God has said one thing, but something else is true. Man denies or contradicts that God, what God has said about the inspiration of the Bible. For one example. Second Timothy 3.16, God says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, but man adds it not. Some of the scriptures they would say are just the writings of men. They're men just recording their stories. Those are just men exchanging conversations with one another. God says all scripture is given by inspiration. Man is there quickly to say not. He's not there. And when I was thinking about that, you all have may have seen them too. I've seen them over the, over the, over the decades. Sermons that were entitled, Knots and the Devil's Tale making a pun as if the devil had a physical tail with knots tied in it, but in fact the truth in the devil's story, the devil's T-A-L-E, has a lot of knots in it. Where God has said some things are true, Satan is quick to be there to say, not, that's not true. One more example, man denies or contradicts what God has told us about salvation. Mark 16, 16, words of Jesus. Jesus said, who believe, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Man says, he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Satan just inserts a knot there. First Peter 3.21, God says, baptism doth also now save us. Man says, well, baptism doth also now not save us. Man denying, directly contradicting the things that are in the scriptures about a topical is important, topic is important to salvation. So many areas today where God says one thing and man is quick to add the knot. No, that's not true. Men are causing us to think skeptically about God. You see, if they can convince us 
that he has told us a lie in one area. If they can convince us that he's not been forthright and truthful with us in one area, that brings his whole credibility into question. If he can be dishonest about one thing, he can be dishonest about anything. Beware of those who try to get us to doubt God, to think skeptically about the things that God has told us. One more cunning thing that Satan did with his statements is he tries to get Eve to take God lightly. And what I mean by that is don't take so seriously the things that God is saying. God is saying things that imply that you have some accountability to him, that this is a very serious matter. Satan is there, no, just don't take it quite so seriously. And I want to tell you, I think this is one of the most dangerous things that we have today. God, in effect, here says, tells Eve there are going to be consequences to her actions. Satan says, yeah, don't worry about that so much. It's not really going to be that bad. So God says, you shall not eat it. You shall not touch it lest you die. Satan says, you're not going to die. Don't, don't, don't be so concerned about what God says. Don't take it so seriously. How dangerous is that? And to me, this is slightly different than to say God's lying. You can find the things and you can try to insert the knots to directly contradict it. But when you introduce the idea that this whole thing is just not, it's, don't be so serious about the things God says in the Bible. Because it's not going to be that important. Jesus says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Matthew 7, 13. Men say, how could a God of love and mercy actually punish people in hell? God said it, but they're there to say, nah, you're just taking that way too seriously. The result is that man winds up not believing a vital, vital point, And that is there are eternal consequences to the things we do on this earth. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Paul says, if we do bad things, there are eternal consequences. Man says, I nah, don't take that so seriously. God's really not going to give us. God is not really going to hold us accountable for what we do. Galatians 6.7, Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for what a man sows. That he will also reap. Man says that's not true. When they deny what God has said about reaping and sowing, they indeed are mocking God. And God will not be mocked. He warns us we will reap what we sow. We are indeed accountable to him. So I think even from that brief discussion, and I imagine you could get similar lessons from some of the others. What important lessons we can learn about Satan just from what Satan said to Eve. We can learn that Satan wants man to think negatively about God. He's the one depriving us of all the good things and the fun things. Skeptically about God, yeah, sometimes God just lies to us. And maybe to think lightly about God. What a disaster if men do not realize that they are accountable to the almighty creator who made them. That's the way things were in Genesis chapter 3. They're not that much different today. So, this evening, has somebody convinced you to take things lightly that God has said in the Scriptures? I mean, there are so many principles of Christian living today. Christian principles that involve morality. Christian principles that involve worship. Christian principles that involve Christian living that people are very desirous not to comply with those. And if they find out that we do, they may give us that really with the two question marks. Really? <laughs> Why would you do that? You're just taking this whole thing too seriously. But we know better. And for those who have not yet become Christians, there's the same kind of skepticism introduced. Jesus said, believe, John 8, 24, repent, Luke 13, 3, confess, Matthew 10, 32, be baptized, Mark 16, 16. If you've not done those things, please do not be distracted. Please do not be, see, be deceived by all the people that say, oh, you don't have to do all those things. They're not essential. Being convinced that we don't have accountability to God, 
that God has not been truthful to us about what we must do, that is one of Satan's most dangerous tactics. If, you can, if we can help you some way this evening, please come forward as we sing. Three verses and in the chorus. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? Sadly you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sentence of life or of death. What will the sentence be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Please be seated. Did I miss anyone uh, that was not here this morning that needed to partake of the Lord's Supper? There's not anyone? All right. Uh, let's turn to number 720 and sing the first two verses. It's kind of a, a reflection on the lesson that we had this morning on communion, taking the Lord's Supper. We'll sing the first two verses of number 720. Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble grow? Why did He choose the lowly bird? Because He loved me so. Take this time now to turn to number 638 after our announcements. We're going to sing uh, when the roll is called up on yonder, number 638.
Thank you, Brother Roberts, and thank you so much, Brother Crowley. It's nice to hear you preach twice in in a day. And the wiles of the devil never never bad to remind us about that because he is very real. And thank you, Brother Stewart and uh, Brother O'Bannon, for covering. <laughs> I was supposed to come up here and receive, but I didn't. Uh, please remember me in your prayers. I'm uh, there are various body parts in my lower back that are talking to me even now. Uh, if we do have any visitors here with us tonight. Uh, please fill out a visitor's card if you have an opportunity. Leave it uh, in the foyer on your way out or stop one of us. Make sure that we have that so we can get a record of your attendance. You're always our welcome guest. Uh, for those seeking our bulletin, it is electronic only right now uh, on our website or by way of email if you're on the congregation's mailing list. Kathy Woods, it's wonderful to see her here today. Uh, her brother, who lives in New Hampshire, has tested positive, positive for the coronavirus. We want to keep that family in our prayers. Ron Trotter's brother, Bob, who lives in Oregon, also has COVID-19. He is at home right now, but if his breathing worsens, he will be hospitalized, so let's keep the trotters in our prayers, and obviously also for the sake of June. Former member Jerry Parker is improving, though he's still unable to walk. Uh, Tracy Smith's mother, Annette Smith, died this past 11th. Her funeral will be held on the 30th for family and close friends only. In lieu of flowers, donations can be made to Blue Santa or Special Olympics. And Tracy would like to express his appreciation to the congregation for love and support of everyone who's done something to try to help him keep up his spirits. So that's uh, four families right there. Let's keep them in our prayers. All the ladies participating in the Christmas sock exchange pick up their gifts from the table outside of the office. As apparently they've already done that because I saw the table being broken down. So that's that's good. Uh, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, Brenda Ratcliffe will hold a Zoom reveal party. Uh, so I hope they're making a whole bunch of money. I bet they are. Zoom, that is. Uh, today is the deadline for Christmas Help Your Neighbor Project list on the youth, youth bulletin board. Um, so if you've not brought something for that collection, uh, and would like to do something else, there's still time uh, to leave a monetary donation before you leave the building tonight. But it looks like a wonderful collection of things. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. We appreciate very much your willingness to donate and help those in need. Um, the monetary donations, by the way, are being used to pay for grocery gift cards, which are always handy. A card from Steve and Janice Springer uh, has been posted on the bulletin board in the main foyer. Uh, they send their love and appreciation to the congregation for all the support that they have received with their various health struggles. And let's keep them in our prayers for no other reason because they are totally isolated right now from their loved ones here. And finally, before our last song and prayer for the next two Wednesday evenings, Christmas Eve Eve and New Year's Eve Eve, all classes will meet in the auditorium for a short devotional. So please remember, come here, usual time, but directly to the auditorium for a devotional service on the 23rd and the 30th. If you would please now be standing for our closing song and prayer. Let's sing the first and last verse of this song. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. 
When the saints of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the road is called up yonder I'll be there. When the road Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day that you've blessed us with. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather as a church and worship you, Father. Thank you, Father, for all of your great many blessings, Father, and for your Son and his perfect sacrifice for us and for his perfect example, Father. Please, Father, help us to follow that example and spread your love and your mercy and your message to the world, Father. Please, Father, help us to leave here and to live Christianly lives and be well-pleasing to you. It is through your Son, Jesus' holy and blessed name that we pray. Amen.